rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel and begin by sharing the verse together. Alleluia! When the day is drew near for an end to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When the day is drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was not because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. They went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We continue with our sermon. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. My name is Hisham Shehab. Uh, Pastor Lind uh, did very well. Uh, pronouncing my late name, and Peter too. Uh, usually they butcher my name, and I've been called Shish Kebab before. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our Lord Jesus Christ's last words before he was taken to heaven were, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all what I commanded you, and behold, I'll be with you till the end of time. We call this the Great Commission, but for some of us it has become a great recommendation. Jesus commanded us to go make disciples of all nations, the Hispanic, the Somalis, the Arabs, the Greek, the Africans, the German, what have you. Yes, Jesus meant all nations. For why we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, as St. Paul said. Jesus died for all, not only for Christians, actually, not only for Lutherans, for all. He died for Saddam Hussein, he died for Bin Laden, he died for Donald Trump, no comparison, but... Uh, <laughs> right? Sometimes we are isolated in our cocoon as Lutherans to the extent that we may imagine that Jesus was Norwegian, right? And we forget that he was a Jew who walked the streets of the Holy Land 2,000 years ago. And we tend to uh, reach the people who look like us or have the same culture. And we forget that at the foundation of the church, the first day of, Penta uh, of the foundation of the church, on the day of Pentecost, there were people from different races from all over the old world. They came for the for pilgrimage, right? And uh, if you go back to the book of Acts, chapter 2, you'll read that there were Greeks, there were Medes. Medes today are the Kurds. Kurds with a K, not with a C. Okay, and nothing to do with the cows. Okay, Kurds with a K. And the Iraqis. Uh, there were Parthians, means Persians, the Iranians. There were uh, people from Egypt, Mesopotamia, uh, which is Iraq and sometimes Syria. And there were Arabs too. And then there were people, Jews from Cyrene. 
Some people may say, well, these are old names, but Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene carried Jesus cross on Calvary. A North African carried Jesus cross on Calvary. So we have really to be inclusive. And there are, you know, uh, sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission, uh, these things that we do, I mean, uh, we commit. And those who, by omission, sins of omission, they, things we do not do. We are ordered, really, to to go and make disciples of all nations, reach them. Uh, speaking of races and ethnicities, let me tell you a story. When I first came to Chicago in uh, uh, 2006, 2007, you know, uh, I didn't have a GPS and I was lost downtown on the south side. And uh, so I waited for a guy to show me where to go. And he said, pull over and I'll show you. I thought he's going to mug me, so I kept driving. <laughs> and, uh, I got to a McDonald's, so I parked in the parking lot and went in, and I saw a man reading a book. So I thought this is a sign of a civilized man in Chicago and safe, you know, so I can ask him about directions. So he said, you could have just, uh, you know, kept driving and you would have hit the campus of, of the University of Chicago, you know. Most probably that guy was going to mug me, really. But I mean, uh, so I looked, he was, the book had something to do about religion. So I asked him, sir, what do you do? He said, actually, I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, professor of religious studies. I told him, sir, it seems we are almost in the same business, you know. <laughs> so I pulled out my business card, uh, then it was written Arab Lutheran. Arab Lutheran, there's an oxymoron, like a contradiction of terms. He looked at me, you're not Norwegian, you're not Swede, what made you Lutheran? So I had to tell him the good old story. Uh, speaking uh, about how one word can change one word, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can change the whole world, okay? I was going into a bank building in Beirut, Lebanon, Okay, Beirut, Lebanon, south of Turkey, not south of Texas, okay? <laughs> when I bumped into a retired Lutheran pastor from northern Minnesota, Reverend uh, Dr. Bernie Lutz, uh, his name, promised his wife when they retire, you know, uh, northern Minnesota is snowland. So when they retire, he'll take her south. So he took her to Lebanon. And uh, <laughs> they were supposed to revive the Lutheran Hour ministry, okay? Lutheran Hour Ministry is a ministry that shares the gospel with uh, all over the world, sometimes through radio, to, uh, broadcasting, or printing literature it's in different languages, etc. So, and the office was destroyed in the Civil War, and Bernie Lutz, uh, there in that elevator, he came really uh, to refer to the office, but I bumped into him in a bank building, you know, I mean, imagine. I was going to the bank and he was going down and uh, and he pulled out his card and uh, I looked at the card and, said, uh, and he gave it to me and he said, God is love, you know. Now he tried to, to say it in Arabic, God is love in Arabic is Allah Mahabbah. And there were five people in the elevator, he was pulling cards saying, Allah, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> like, you know, uh, very, very funny. So. I looked at the card, Lutheran Hour Ministry of the Middle East. Hmm, he was the first Lutheran specimen I had ever seen. You know? So I thought maybe he could. Uh, I was teaching a course at the American University of Beirut on Europe, and I thought he could come and uh, uh, talk about the Reformation. And I called him, we became friends, and uh, I started uh, translating his Bible studies. And after three years, lo and behold, he asked me to come to Fort Wayne to seminary. I'll tell you more about the story downstairs, but when uh, ba Pastor Benny Lutz told St. Louis, the holy city, that he's gonna, uh, uh, he intends to go to, uh, to Lebanon, they told him, why go to Lebanon? He said, I want to share the gospel with Muslims, you know? They told him in Lebanon, uh, half the population used to be Christian. So why let the Christian Arabs share the gospel with the Muslim Arabs, you know? But 
uh, actually the Christian Arabs uh, did not share the gospel with the Muslim Arabs. They uh, were not good neighbors. Uh, uh, downstairs you'll, uh, you'll know more about this to Lebanon, but uh, uh, we, uh, the Christians of Lebanon are the only uh, large majority population in the Arab world that are not persecuted and they started, I can say, a civil war, and they killed my brother, my only sibling. I was born in a Muslim family, and uh, we were caught in a civil war, and my only brother, my only sibling, was killed. He was two years older than me. I was a student at the American University of Beirut in college, my first semester, actually, and I want to forget about the civil war, but my only brother, my only sibling, was killed by a Christian militia. I got a silencer and a gun and decided to kill my enemies. And I sought revenge this week. And uh, uh, that semester, I, I signed up for a course of cultural studies. Now, uh, that was a college requirement. And uh, that course of cultural studies included uh, selections from uh, world religions, uh, from uh, Greek mythology, from selections only, from the Old Testament, selections from the New Testament, and coming back from a night of stalking my enemies with a gun and a silencer, I, uh, I sat in the classroom and I heard something that would change my whole life. It was a selection from the Sermon on the Mount. Seeking, uh, stalking my enemies with a gun in silence, I heard for the first time, love your enemies. I thought, wow, this is ri ridiculous or superhuman. Who could love his enemies? Who could tear the other cheek? So I was baffled by that. Uh, the next day, you know, uh, the professor wanted to compare between the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, and the uh, the greatest commandment that Jesus talked about in uh, Matthew 22, I believe, and uh, when uh, the Pharisees came and asked Jesus about the, the greatest commandment, they, uh, they, they wanted to trick him. Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, for somebody like me, then a Muslim, I thought Muslims are trying to love God more than anybody else. If you think it's a big deal to come to church on Sunday morning, imagine that devout Muslims come to, mo to the mosque five times a day. The first one is at dawn, at, at 4 30 in the morning. Who is ready to come at 4 30 in the morning to church, right? And they have the five pillars of Islam, and they go to pilgrimage, and then they are ready to die for Allah. And I thought, they are trying to love Allah or God, I thought, more than anybody else. But Jesus Christ seems he is overdoing it. I've never heard anybody speak about loving God in this powerful way. So I checked out a copy of the Bible from, from uh, the library. It was King James Version. And I read Shakespeare, so I was able to understand King James. And, uh, and I discovered gems, like uh, the Lord's Prayer, you know. And, uh, but I thought I should never leave any stone unturned. If uh, I memorize half the Quran by heart, you know. And I thought, if I'm looking for the truth, I should really look for the truth in Eastern philosophy, in Hinduism, in Buddhism. So I looked for a Hindu temple or a Buddhist temple. There was no internet then, you know, 1980. I couldn't find any. The only thing I found was a yoga course. <laughs> so I signed up for the yoga course at the American University of Beirut. And uh, I walked into the classroom. It was the early days of yoga in Lebanon, so all the students were ladies, girls. So I was the only guy. And the the instructor thought I am, I came in by mistake. I said, no, no, really, I signed up for this course. She said, so what's the purpose? Why did you sign up? I told her, I want to reach God through spiritual exercises, okay, through Eastern spirituality. 
She said, wow, you came to the right place. Forget about Christianity, forget about Islam. You can reach God through spiritual exercises. I said, great, let's start. She said, no, you have to cleanse your body. I asked her, what do you mean by cleansing my body? She said, you have to be vegetarian, okay, before you start yoga. So I was a guy pushing 21 years old. I was uh, doing three martial arts because I was full of hate. I wanted to kill my enemies with my bare hands needed. I used to jog five miles a day. And I had to get energy by munching of fruits and vegetables half of the day, you know, and sp spend the other half of the day in the bathroom because of the fibers, you know. <laughs> so if you eat, uh, uh, you know, five pounds of uh, apples and three pounds of, of uh, bananas and three pounds of raw peanuts and, uh, what, uh, and five pounds of oranges, you know where you end up, right? <laughs> so, but in two months, she said you are the most serious yoga student I had ever seen. And uh, she said, we'll give you a mantra that will dig into your soul, and then you'll climb up to God step by step. There are seven steps. A mantra is a uh, Sanskrit word, old Indian word, and it's kind of uh, like, uh, if you remember David Carradine and his own, you know, yeah. something like that. So I had to repeat that thousands of times every day. The more I repeated that mantra, the more stupid I felt, actually. The more I repeated that mantra, the more I felt that I'm not climbing up to God. I'm going down in my filth. There's a better word I can't use in church. <laughs> and it dawned on me, we might try to climb up to God with our spiritual exercises. We may try to climb up to God with our good work. But we cannot do it. It's an upside down story. In Jesus Christ, God came down to us and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I saw that the, the, do the doors of heaven were opened and that my sins were forgiven and I wanted to follow Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, uh, we may uh, be negligent about the Great Commission and uh, we do not really kind of uh, feel diffident about inviting our neighbors to church, but God will give us the power and he forgives us for our sins. We, uh, we break the law every, every day, but God in his mercy sent his, his only son. It's an upside down story. He came down to us. The word became flesh. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. He gave us the most precious thing because he loves us and we, have, we should love him back by sharing the water of life with our neighbor. Invite our neighbors to church. However, some of us take, uh, you know, this, uh, 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 John 3.16 as a license to live a sinful life. But, but God wants us to be light and salt for the nations. Light and salt. I saw in the uh, uh, office of uh, Pastor Oswald uh, a book on, uh, by Metaxas. Uh, I remember that he also wrote uh, on uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some people say Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian. He was very brilliant. He earned a PhD at the age of 23. He was during Nazi Germany and he was invited to come teach in New York. But he thought that his calling is to go back and preach against Nazi Germany in Nazi Germany. And he founded a seminary where he would graduate seminarians, pastors who are not afraid of Nazis. And two weeks before the end of World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested, detained, tortured, and executed naked. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, titled The Cost of Discipleship. 
Discipleship is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. Jesus poured his precious blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins for the whole world. And we have to go and share the gospel with the world. And we have to go working out of victory, not for victory. Because Jesus accomplished victory on the cross for us. We have to go and preach the gospel victorious. Uh, we have baptized as Salamus a mission to the Muslims I found in 2007 in Northern Illinois, more than 45 people. One of those was a Muslim, a woman, who uh, had been coming to Salam for a few years. She was going to the Bible studies, and uh, I thought she's uh, impervious to the gospel. She didn't move. She was devout Muslim. She was fasting. She was praying. And I saw she never really come to the waters of baptism. And one day she came and uh, she said, I am ready. I asked her, what happened? She said, I compared between the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. The disciples of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, came out of Arabia. They conquered the whole world in, in 25 years. In, in less than 100 years, they conquered from India to Morocco to Spain. Even they reached France. And they, they built empires and massed fortunes. But they killed each other for this world. Until today, Shia and Sunni Muslims kill each other. But the disciples of Jesus, after they waited for the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, and after the Holy Spirit fell on them on the day of Pentecost, they came out of Jerusalem preaching the gospel all the way to Rome, dying under persecution, dying under the sword, never revoked Christ. They must have seen something in this resurrected Christ that I want. I want that power. I want that forgiveness in the resurrected Christ. Only God, only the gospel, the power of the gospel, only the Holy Spirit can reveal to somebody something like this. We can't do it out of our power. It's by the power of the gospel. When St. Paul said uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, he used a word in Greek. The gospel is the dynamis of God. We derive from that word dynamite. So he was saying the gospel is the dynamite of God. It changes hearts, it changes nations, it changes hearts of stones to hearts of flesh. And we have to work out of victory, not for victory. Because we know that we are victorious in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our salvation and did not uh, leave anything uh, undone. It was accomplished. <coughs> And uh, when he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, he did not stop there. He did not say only uh, teaching them to observe uh, how uh, uh, all my commandments. He said, behold, I'll be with you till the end of times. We have to surrender to him. And he'll use us as tools for his kingdom. Only surrender to him. Only to be available. What did the prophet Isaiah say? Here am I, send me. I'm available. It's whether you're available or not. Just surrender to Jesus Christ and he'll, he'll use you for his glory. He'll give you his power and boldness. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, may to God be all the glory. May the God of hope fill, up, fill us with joy and peace and boldness so that we invite our neighbors to the church through the, the power of the Holy Spirit and may this church a lighthouse for this community. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit.
Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Well, in church here now, this morning, we're going to fulfill the last part of that last verse of the Apostle St. Paul, where he says to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're going to rejoice, we're rejoicing this morning with someone here at Hope who certainly has been rejoicing themselves. We have a young lady here at Hope who celebrated her 97th birthday yesterday, Pearl Estes. <laughs> What a, what, a, what a occasion for you, you know. It you know, certainly is. What a blessing. I'd like to share a prayer with you this morning, if we could, okay? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we're here to celebrate with Pearl. Such a monumental place in her life. After 97 years, we thank you for your blessings in her life each day. We thank you for filling her with that blessed faith and assurance of her place in your kingdom, and we thank you, God, for her family and, and for all of those who are a part of this celebration of this momentous occasion. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you continue to watch upon her and, and we know, Lord, that she is your child and that all things work for the good of those who are in you. So, she's got a lot of good coming in her life as well as we do. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed birthday and ask you to continue to fill her heart with that joy and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully, you received one of these little, tiny, little, I didn't realize they were going to be that small, <laughs> uh, the birthday song, entitled The Birthday Song. And, and did you get one? Oh, you got one? Okay, okay. Uh, so, it's, it's, two, it's the melody to the church's one foundation. And, and so Doris is going to play a little introduction, and then we're going to sing a birthday song. Just one. <laughs> yeah, don't go <open>. back. <laughs> Yeah. 